Welcome to modern C++ testing with catch2. We'll get on to exactly what catch is and what the difference between catch and catch2 is shortly. But uh, I'm Phil Nash. I am a developer advocate of JetBrains. So if you want to know anything about the JetBrains products, uh, come and catch me afterwards or down on the, uh, the JetBrains booth. Always happy to talk to people. We're not going to be talking about JetBrains products in this talk today. We're going to be talking about catch, which is uh, also something uh, that I'm heavily involved with, the original author. Um, and still the uh, lead maintainer. Um, but before we get on to that, I just want to talk a little bit about this photo. So you may be wondering what this is a photo of. I was uh, searching, um, just, just Googling for photos to do with catch, just to see what comes up. And this is one of the search results. And on the, it came from Flickr, and the photographer had a little story about it, which was that it, it reminded him of a superhero catching a speeding bullet. And you can sort of see that there, sort of you know, catching a bullet-like shape. But what it actually is, is a handrail on a bridge, somewhere just outside Toronto, I believe. And it's just taken a very narrow depth of field, and that's, that's where the blur's coming from. So it's got nothing to do with catch at all, but I really <laughs> like the photo, so I decided to keep it in. So that, that's what that is. Uh, so almost ready to start. I just want to point out that a lot of my slides are brought to you with the help of classic programmer paintings. If you haven't seen this Tumblr, you really need to check it out. Uh, it's just lots of classic oil paintings with the titles changed to something to do with software development. Uh, some of them are really, really amusing. So you'll see plenty of those. Uh, also a little bit of uh, help from Twitter. Uh, one or two sprinkled through just to lighten the mood. <laughs> but I think we should get started with something a bit more serious. It's so the first oil painting. And I uh, just want to talk just for a moment about the cost of bugs. Bugs are not the only reason that we, we do unit testing. Uh, definitely a, a big part of it. We want to get a low defect rate in our code. I mean, who here doesn't want to lower the defect rate in their code? No, I didn't think so. We all want to lower the defect rate. So we know that testing is a big part of that. But it's nice to put some numbers to it. There was a study in 2002 by NIST, and uh, they had a, there's, there's quite a long um, article about it. There'll be references at the end if you want to look that up, which I encourage you to do. Uh, I've just got a few choice quotes from that study, though, which I think are, are quite interesting. First of all, that software bugs are costing the US economy, so it's just the US economy, in 2002, remember, an estimated $59.5 billion each year. It's quite staggering if you think about it. Just waste it on, on bugs. And then improvements in testing could reduce this cost by about a third, or 22 and a half billion. So testing alone won't, won't solve the problem, but a big chunk of it, they've estimated, could be improved. This is back in 2002. <coughs> and then the final bit, the general consensus seems to be that the current state of the art with respect to testing is poor and can be sufficiently improved. So do bear in mind, it's in 2002, just sort of before the start of the Agile re revolution. Could be argued that the state of the art with regard to testing has improved since then, but I think we've still got a little way to go, particularly uh, in C++, where it's not been quite as big a part of the ecosystem <coughs> as, as other languages. Uh, and in fact, we'll, we'll come on to how that fits into our topic today in a moment. But I think that's a little bit too heavyweight, so quicker go back to Twitter. <laughs> So, <laughs> why, did I, why did I write Catch in the first place? So back in 2010, I started work on a project where the approach to software quality was basically, you know, hope and pray. And um, I was running into a lot of problems because of this. So I decided to have a look around at what the state of the art with regards to testing was at the time in C++. And there is a, there's a Wikipedia page with um, all the test frameworks broken down by language. And the, the list of test frameworks for C++ is, is quite big. I don't expect you to read this all. There's actually 76 entries in there. And that's not exhaustive. There'd be plenty that aren't on there. So why did I decide to write yet another testing framework? Well, I can't say I tried all of these, but I did try all the, all the main ones, all the popular ones at the time. 
the big names that you'd recognize, won't name names. But I didn't particularly like any of them. Um, not that I didn't respect the work that had gone into them, but it's just too hard to, to get them, to set them up, get them running, and just to, to write code in them in the, uh, when you do get them up and running. Too much ceremony, too much friction. I mean, getting people to, to write tests in the first place is hard enough. But if you make that even harder, it's not going to do it. They're going to give up, be disheartened, and think that it's just too much extra work. I wanted to cut through all of that, to give people something that was simple, easy to get, easy to use, and actually fun to test. So whether I achieve that, or I'll leave that to you. I'm going to show you some, some examples, some demos, go through some features, and I'll let you decide. I'm not going to, not going to give you any, any leading titles at all. But what I'm going to do is drop to a demo. If I switch that over. OK, so, whoa, too far. So here I've got C-Line, JetBrains IDE. Um, did say we wouldn't be talking about that, but I lied. Uh, what we're going to do is just create a new project. Let's call it Catch Test 4, because I've run through this demo a couple of times now. So it's a brand new project. Completely fresh, and like any good IDE, it puts a load of junk in there that you don't really want. Get rid of that. So now we have no code. So it's a good place to to start, right? Really. So what we're going to do in true TDD fashion is write some code that won't compile because we don't even have this header file yet. So catch is a single header library. It's a single file. We don't have it. So of course that's not going to compile. So put the file over here just to save me getting it from GitHub, but that's all you have to do. I'm going to drag that in, and now that does compile, but it doesn't link because we don't have a main. So what we do is just before that include, we define catch config main. And that should now compile and link to the screen. There you go. And that's a complete working application, believe it or not. If we run that, you see, not particularly interesting. We haven't written any tests, but it does tell us that at least. That's, that's quite nice. And if we go to a terminal, let me just grab the, uh, the path. Um, copy path. And what did I call it? Cache test four. There we go. So we can see that we've also got a complete command line processor in there. We'll look at a bit more later. So it's quite rich. Quite a lot you can do before we've even written more than two lines of code. Now we can go ahead and start writing code in this file. The trouble is because we've written that catch config main, it's going to compile the whole library into that file. So it's going to be a bit slow. So what I'm going to do is um, create a new file, tests, let's include catch again. Oh. Now we're ready to start writing some tests. So write a test case. We don't even need to give it a name. And if you've used other testing frameworks, you might be surprised we have to give it a class as well. Because test cases in catch are really just functions. They've generated for you behind the scenes. And now we can write an assertion, which is require in catch. There's another form we'll look at later. So some pretty straightforward maths. I'm sure this is going to work first time. Let's run that and see what happens. And it failed. Well, now we can see what the failure looks like. So you can see we, it has named our test, just an anonymous test case. We'll come back and name it in a moment. Given us all the file and nine numbers. Come down here, we can see the, the assertion we wrote. But here, we can see it's been able to expand the values that we wrote even though we haven't had to separate it out, as you might have seen in other test frameworks. Instead of saying assert equals, assert not equals, um, we just use a simple expression. And 
Catch uses expression templates to decompose that expression and then reconstruct it for you so that it gives you rich output without you having to contort the way you write the code. So let's go, go in and um, <coughs> give it a name as well. And you'll see again, unlike many other test frameworks, we can just write a plain string here rather than having to contort our test names into legal identifiers. And now, why is this failing? I'm pretty sure the maths is right. What I forgot to do was do it in base 13, of course. <laughs> so we don't have a base 13 function. What I've done is uh, prepared one earlier so we don't have to type it all out. There we go. <laughs> pretty simple. If we run that now, we can see that it all works. They're all green. So it's like nice color coding there as well. Now, if you are using uh, C line uh, or ReSharp or C++, it has a, uh, a built-in catch test runner that we can also use. So we find catch in the list there. If we run that again now, we see it runs in this hierarchical view. Um, maybe if we make that fail, it'd be more interesting. There we go. You can see the, uh, the output again. Okay, so that's our demo for the mo first demo for the moment. Let's go back to our slides. So that is just catch, plain catch, as it's been for about ten years, um, eight years, sorry. But Catch was originally written for C++ 98 or free, so it came out in 2010, predated C++ 11. And in fact, for, for years, a large proportion of the user base was still stuck in very um, prehistoric C++. But what I really wanted to do was turn the dials up to 11. <laughs> C++ 11, of course. Um, I didn't want to you know, break compatibility for, for everyone else. So I put it off, put it off, put it off, until last year. Finally said, enough is enough, and decided to take a branch at a major version. So we're now on catch two, and breaking compatibility, so it's C++ 11 only, but we still have catch 1x on a branch, so if you are stuck with an older compiler, you can still use it. Uh, and we are maintaining that with um, at least important bug fixes. Been two or three over the last nine months or so, so it's not very high traffic. Um, but if you are stuck on that, then you know, I'm sorry, but um, Catch has moved on. So what's new in, in Catch 2? Apart from the language change, because uh, one thing that was really nice about moving to C++11 was the Catch code base is, um, is big enough for that to be interesting and meaningful, but small enough that we could go in and just do a, a complete um, update to C++11, find all the nooks and crannies and all the all the things that uh, have been weighing us down over the years, update it to C++11. It's great for us as maintainers, but it doesn't really do a lot for the users. So what else is new in, in Catch 2? Well, let's have a little dig below the surface, um, because some of the, the changes do run quite deep. But we're going to look at just a number of uh, new features. Um, here's a, a list of most of the major things. We're not going to cover them all now. I just want to dig into just a few of these. And I want to start with a new name. And first of all, why, why does it need a new name? A lot of people tell me that it's very hard to find information about catch by searching on, on Google, particularly on Stack Overflow. Uh, it's such an overloaded term in C++ and testing and the intersection of the two. So even if you put extra keywords in there, it doesn't seem to help much. Um, people are complaining about this for long enough that <coughs> So I didn't really need to do something, but I didn't want to break the momentum behind the name as well. It's already starting to become popular. I didn't want to lose that. So the new name for catch is catch2. <laughs> and it might sound like a silly thing, but over the last nine months since we've, we've released catch2, that situation has improved. It's now much easier to find information online about catch2. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing these talks is to, to try and you know, publicize that, that name change so that people write more about Catch 2 and we get better search results. But it's working. 
and we haven't really had to, to break too much. Uh, another one I'm going to mention briefly is uh, micro benchmarks. I started putting support for this in um, because I was doing a lot of uh, uh, benchmarking. Uh, I was mostly using a framework called uh, Nonius. Uh, I don't know if you've used that at all. I wanted something similar but uh, was built into Catch and ran more like Catch because um, there's a lot of shared infrastructure involved. So started putting support in. It's not really complete. It's definitely not production ready. You can try it out, but um, you know, please don't rely on it. But what's interesting is since I did that, the author of Nonius, uh, R. Martino Fernandez, or RMF, you often see him, um, his name as, he approached me and uh, talked about merging our efforts, actually merging a lot of the Nonius code base, maybe into Catch. So that might actually help just to round it out. Um, of course, you haven't had time to, to follow through on that yet, but that, that's something that's coming. So into the future. Okay, another big feature is matches. This actually came in uh, just at the end of catch one, um, but it's actually been rounded out a lot more in catch two, so I think it's worth putting it in here. Um, I think I've, uh, okay. We'll come back to matches because I, I accidentally put this in the wrong place. I just added this just before we started, so I forgot about this. Just recently we've added support for FNO exceptions. So if you do run in an environment where exceptions are not possible, you can now use catch for the first time. It's been a long requested feature. They said it couldn't be done, but uh, we did it. I, I believe if it, um, a test does fail, which would normally involve um, throwing an exception to terminate, it will terminate the whole application. So it's, it's not great, but you can use it. But what I wanted to talk about was matches. So there it is, I just put the slide in the wrong place. Um, if you've used matches in other languages, it should all be familiar. But if you haven't, I'll just walk you through it a little bit. So we have a, an alternative uh, set of macros. We've got require that and check that. And then the first argument is that the thing you want to actually, the value you want to test. And the second argument is the matcher. So in this case, we're looking at string matches. So we want to see whether this string contains a substring or starts with a substring, ends with a substring. So pretty useful already. Gets even more powerful when you compose them together using the, the logical composition operators and and or, also not. You can use brackets for the president. So it's, it's a very rich uh, compositional approach to uh, building some quite complex uh, matches out, just out of very simple components. So that's really nice. But it's not just strings. Uh, we've got some built-in matches for uh, vectors, for example. So these ones test whether a vector uh, contains a specific element. Uh, and then we've got variants that will um, test whether a vector contains another vector. Uh, we've got uh, uh, some similar ma matches for maps and things like that as well. But matches are a completely open um, customization point. So you can write your own matches for anything you like. So. Yeah, check that, and then there was another, what was the other one? There were two commands, so check and, that yeah. and require that. Require that. Yeah, I, I skipped over the difference between the, the check and require forms. Um, they basically work exactly the same, but with a require, if the test fails, it will uh, abort the, the test. If a check fails, it will carry on, but it will just report the failure. So that's the difference. May I ask, um, uh, do you guys have vector contains and just contains? Couldn't it be the overlooked? That's here. So the, the, the question was, why do we have uh, vector contains and contains? So they mean different things. Um, and I wanted to do this using overloading. I can't remember exactly what the problem was now, but it wasn't possible. I think there was some ambiguity somewhere. So I had to disambiguate one of them. Um, that's what I ended up with. I'm never quite happy with it, but I was more interested in giving the functionality. And, if you've got any ideas for improving it, then do let me know. So, custom matches. So, all you have to do is write a class that has a couple of overloads. Just walk you through it very briefly. So, you just need to derive from this base class um, where it's templatized on the thing you're matching. In this case, special exception. Then we have a constructor that takes the thing you want to test against and it stores it at the member variable. Then the first overload is match, that just takes the thing being tested against to compare with 
the thing you're holding, however you want to do that. That's where you do your, your match your logic, of course. And then describe, just to, um, just to be able to print out what's happened in the event of the failure. So that will depend on the, the value you're holding as well. And that's it. Fulfill those, you've got your custom matcher. So it's, it's really simple to, to knock up your own matches as well. The reason I used an exception here uh, as an example, is we've got an, another couple of new uh, assertion macros specific to using these, uh, these type of matches with exceptions. So this can now test whether a function throws a particular type, and if it does, whether it then matches whatever your conditions are. So you can get some quite powerful exception matching going. Uh, we're never quite happy with the names of those, but uh, again, the functionality is the important part. So that's matches. The next uh, feature I want to talk about is the, uh, the command line processor. So back in the early days of catch, I realized that the, the command line processing was getting so uh, full featured that it was almost like a, a library in itself. And so I spun it out to a separate library called Clara. Uh, but similar to catch at the time, constrained to C++ uh, 03 or 98, um, you know, a couple of um, slightly dead end design decisions as well. So I took the opportunity with catch 2 to completely rewrite Clara as well not only for C++11, but also of a much nicer design, I think, which allows it to be composable as well. And that, that's a really important point. That's why I want to highlight this. Um, because another one of the long requested features in Catch was the ability to hook into the command line uh, argument processing yourself. So if you're writing a test, you might sometimes also want to take additional arguments in the command line and incorporate those in your tests. Uh, and there was no easy way to do that. But now that Clara is composable, it actually makes things a lot easier. And I'll show you what I mean. I want to do another quick demo. So, do that first. So this is where we got to earlier. Let's bring that down. Now you remember, back in our main file, we said that by writing catch config main, uh, catch will write its own main for us. Uh, and also compile the catch library in there. There's another form, which is catch config runner. If we do that, it's going to still compile the implementation in there, but we now have to supply our own main. Just to shortcut that a bit, I'm going to use another snippet. So, so here we go. So we've got typical main. Then we declare a, a catch session object, which does some clean up at the end. Uh, we can pass the command line arguments in to apply command line, um, and then run our tests. That now gives us some points that we can hook into. So first thing we want to do is, let's imagine we want to be able to set this, this integer on the command line. So the first thing we need to do is grab hold of the current command line interface object. So session.cli. Uh, and now that, that gives us our own copy of it. And now we can just compose directly on top of that using the pipe operator, a new opt. Oh, before we do that, I need to bring in the Clara namespace. That's better. So this opt, I want to bind it to our number. And then we give it a string that's just a hint for the um, uh, for the command line uh, documentation. So let's call that a number. And then we say what arguments, uh, what options we want to bind that to. We're going to use dash n because we, dash n is already taken, and dash dash number. And we can also give it a another string which is just a description. So. There we go, and that's it. We have now have a new command line parser, incorporating all of Catch's original one and our new argument. But this is now a separate parser, because it's all value semantics. So we now to, need to give that back to, to Catch, like that, and we're done. And just to prove that that's all working, 
we'll print out our new value at the end. Should be it. I did that right. Now it's building a hole of catch again, so it takes a bit longer. There we go. Let's go to the, the terminal, run that there. So bringing up the command line documentation again, as we did before, we can see at the end there, we've got our new documentation line, all nicely formatted with line wrapping and everything. We didn't have to do any work for that. It's automatic, it's pulled it out of the, the values we put in. And if we run with dash M 42, of course, you can see up here, it's telling us our number we provided. So it's all working, just with a few lines of code. And because Cl Clara is a, a separate library, you can actually go and pick this up outside of Catch. You can do this yourself. If you've got a, an application that has different components that need to be configured on the command line, but they don't need to know about each other, they can provide their own parsers up to a top level that composes them together, just a couple of lines of code, and you've got a rich command line interface to the whole system. It's quite powerful. So let's go back to the slides. And in fact, generate for generators, I'm gonna go back to the code in a second, but to explain briefly what these are. Uh, a generator is just a way of providing um, it's a lot, potentially large sets of test data to a single test case. So you don't have to write the same test over and over again. Uh, and in some cases even provide combinations of test data. So it could be quite powerful. And originally had a, an initial form of generators in one of the very early versions of Catch. But it had a problem that, um, in fact we didn't get to, uh, to look at sections. But one of the powerful features of Catch is the ability to break a test up into multiple sections that can be nested. And for each section, it will actually run through the whole test case multiple times. So some bookkeeping behind the scenes to see how many times it's run. And that wasn't interacting very well with generators, which needed to do the sort of the same thing. So I've had to rewrite all of that from scratch to, to support generators. And they are now in. So I'm gonna show you that. Just uh, look at the, um, some examples. We go across to here. There we go. Back to, I shall put that in presentation mode. So this is actually from some of the test cases in the uh, the self-test suite for generators. So this first one, all of the generators use this generate macro. That's what does all the, the bookkeeping behind the scenes. And then in here we can compose one or more generators. So this one's just a simple range between one and 11, inclusive. And what will happen is each time it comes into the test case, our x, which will be an integer in this case, will get a new value between one and 11. So we'll come into it there 10 times. But in this case, we've got two generators. We've got a y as well, different range. So this test case is gonna be executed 100 times for that cross product of all those values. So just in a few lines of code, we've covered 100 um, different uh, possibilities. And that's just a small one. Just looking at some other possibilities here. We have another generator for strings. We've had to include this as bit here because obviously these are char stars. If we want them to be generated as strings, we, we pass it through the, uh, the as um, generator. So this will come through and generate a load of strings. And here, we're, instead of a range, we're providing specific values. We can combine these. So in this section, and now we see sections as well, we have a, a range of integers again and a value on its own. So we can actually compose some quite complex generators to, often we want to get a whole range of values and then concentrate on some edge cases. So we can do that all into a single line. And down here, we've got some, some more, some uh, doubles. So again, we get the cross product of all of these running, but we only have to write one assertion each time. And then the other one I wanted to show you 
was, well, there's a few ways to do this one. Um, here we're generating some uh, pairs of values, in this case a string and uh, a size t, so we can see them here, um, which is nice. It's a little bit verbose here, but by using C++ 17 structured bindings, we can actually capture that out quite nicely, just in, in one go. But what can you do about the noisy bit? Well, there's a, a table generator, which just does that for us, just wraps the noisy bit. So we're just going to generate a table of strings and size t's. Everything else is exactly the same. And if you don't have access to C++ 17, we can do it by uh, binding onto uh, structs instead. So we've got our same two values, uh, two types here, just as members of this uh, data struct. And we're just going to generate values of that. Otherwise, it works exactly the same way. And we can even generate random numbers. So here, we're going to ge generate random numbers between um, minus 10,000 and, and plus 10,000. And I think by default, it will just take 100 of those. You can control that. And then we can do something with those random numbers. Um, with catch, when you run it on the command line, you can control a random seed, which you can have seeded from the current time. Um, and if you do that, it will print out what the seed is. So in the case of a failure, you can then rerun it with that seed again manually. So actually using random numbers in tests can be useful if you do that way. Um, and you can also, here's another example with a table, but mix it with BDD macros, given when then, so that, it actually shows you here, does it? No. It will actually incorporate the, the generated values in the test name that it prints out, which if you use these macros, will read like a BDD scenario description. So it would be human readable, have all the information you need, and it's just taken a few lines of code to write it. So if we have time at the end, I'll come back and show you what that looks like when you run it. So let's um, go back to the slides and see where we've got to. Okay. So that's generators. Now, if you've been to any of my catch talks before, you know that I usually sort of round out on a slide like this. Future directions, what's, what's coming up? And I'm gradually chipping away on them. Seems like they've taken a long time. But you can see we're already starting to, to do generators. There's still some more work to do, so I've left it up there. But that's, that's a really big one. The other big one that I've been waiting for C++11 to do, um, so now I've got no excuse, is threading support, which is really hard before C++11, uh, almost trivial now. Uh, and there is some work um, under, underway at the moment, actually, to do that. And the third one's really interesting, property-based testing. And this builds on generators, um, but uh, takes it up to the next level. Um, can I ask if, uh, who here already knows what property-based testing is? So nobody, basically. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> so let me tell you what property-based testing is. So property-based testing is um, similar to what I showed you with generators. So working with ranges of data that are generated for us. Um, usually randomly, um, and you just take a sample of 100 or 1,000 values. Um, what it does differently is in the case of a failure, it will then try to work out what the simplest failure mode is and give you that. It's called shrinking in property-based testing parlance. So you can run it with you know, lots of different random values. They'll be different every time. So if there are any edge cases you've forgotten about, you'll eventually find them. You don't have to come up with examples for every possible case. When it does find it, it will try to simplify it as much as possible so that when you go to debug, you're not working with ridiculous numbers. So that shrinking part is the bit that still needs to be done. But I think that's going to be a really important addition to, to catch. It's a, it's a different way of thinking about writing tests. It's, it doesn't completely replace unit testing, but in many cases, um, it's often the, the preferred first approach. And then we have type parameterized tests. 
So whereas generators are data parameterized tests, uh, it's often nice to be able to write one test that will cover many different template instantiations. Um, and you can do that right now with catch um, by using helper functions, doing a lot of that, that work manually. But it would be nice if there was better support in catch uh, for doing that as well. So that's also coming um, now that we've got generators. And the final one I got in here, because it's a, a big one that uh, frameworks like um, Google Test have um, that Catch doesn't. A lot of people say they're using Google Test for that reason. Is um, def tests or outer proc uh, calls in general. So def test is just where you want to test whether a run of your application actually terminates the program. So it's really hard to do if it's all in the same process. But if you spawn an, another process and see that fail, that uh, terminate, then you can you can actually trap that condition. Of course, that requires you to be able to spawn an external process, which to do in a portable way, in a rich enough way to do this, is, is not quite so trivial. So that's, that's why that's been put off, but it, it will come at some point. So that's all I had on the slides. But I can see I've got enough time to go back, and I wanted to actually run some of those generator tests, because seeing the output is quite interesting. Is it here? No. Here we go. Let's see if I can run just this. It's kind of presentation mode. the long way. Okay, maybe I'm not going to be able to show you that. Do I need to rebuild it? Okay. For some reason I'm not able to run that. Let me see if I can run a different one. It seems like you're actually being done with macro. Sorry? It is. It's surrounded by a macro. Which... Surrounded by a macro? Ah, yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. This one, yeah. you're right. Okay. In that case, let me show you two tests. Thanks for that. That's a good observation. Um, I've got some tests here that will um, demonstrate the BDD macros. So here we can see that the test name is actually printed out as a BDD scenario description. So uh, given when and then, there's some better ones up here. No, that's all of them. And then I can also run let's run the uh, where is it? Disk generators.
Yeah, so here we can see, even though there was only one test case, it's actually run 18 assertions. And we can see all of the values that it ran with, that whole cross product of, of different values. So it's quite powerful. And I think with that, we'll just come back to final slide. There we go. And point out that all the references and links uh, that I mentioned earlier on my website, levelofindirection.com. If you can't remember that, I've also got extra levelofindirection.com that redirects there. Slash storage slash catch refs.html. So you don't have to remember them all. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you and any questions. Yeah. I might not be very familiar with other kind of solutions in that domain. I'm just a little bit surprised to see that everything is kind of macro based. And we just had first session today where Bjarni <laughs> said that don't use macros, they are bad. I'm just wondering, is there any limitation that doesn't allow to make like something object oriented approach? Why macros? So uh, let me try and summarize the question. Why you use macros? Um, it's, a, it's a good question, and I hate using macros. They're used all over the place in Catch. And part of it's historical, because when I first started in the C++ so three days, um, pretty much the only solution we had to a lot of this. Uh, I even wrote a blog post about this a few years ago, uh, where the title for this comes from, Modern C++ Testing, the title of the blog, addressing that exact question. What would a modern test framework look like now if you were trying to avoid you know, too much use of macros by using modern language features instead? And my conclusions were, although there are some things you could do to avoid some of the macros, uh, it probably wouldn't look that different. Most of the macro usage, we don't currently have better alternatives for. In particular, we don't yet have a way to easily capture the, the file in line number. That's in the, in the pipeline. Um, we don't yet have a way to um, get the, the string, stringized form of the expression. Um, we don't yet have a way to minimize sufficiently the boilerplate of uh, setting up and registering a test case as a function. That one you can do with a bit more, if you can tolerate a bit more boilerplate, uh, you can now do it with a, a lambda that will effectively self-register when it, when it executes. Uh, and I think there are some test frameworks that do do that. Um, there's some frameworks that lose some of the richness in reporting so that they can avoid using macros so they don't have the file and line number, for example, or the, the, the string form. So you can do it, but at the moment it's still a trade-off. Uh, and I do look forward to a future where we can do more. Um, so as well as the uh, file and line number, um, reflection would get us a long way as well uh, when that comes. So. We're not there yet. Um, when we get there, that, that will definitely be worth looking at again. But at the moment, um, I'd rather use macros and get um, everything I need out of it. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we're currently on Google Test, um, one of the things we make some use of is Google Box. Um, is there, do you know, is there a mocking framework that plays well with Catch? Yes. So the question was, is there a mocking framework that plays well with Catch? Um, I usually recommend either a Hippo Mox or um, Trompoli. Uh, Trompoli. Um, don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a French word which means trick of the eye or something like that. Oh, Trompoli. Yeah. Um, and they, they're very similar in some respects. They, they try to be sort of modern C++ frameworks that, that work well with Catch. Um, but they, they make different trade-offs. So uh, Trumple um, tries to stick entirely within defined behavior, but at the, the expense of a bit more boilerplate and a bit more uh, setup. Whereas uh, Hippo Mox is okay with a bit of undefined behavior um, because it just works at the moment. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot simpler to use 
um, with, with less water in the plate as a result. So you know, it depends where you want to make that trade off yourself, which one you go for. And I know there are one or two others, I can't remember the names of them now, that people have got working nicely with catch. Um, and then you've got Google Mocks, which doesn't. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, I got a question. So I saw your, in your evaluator for the values, like it can basically print out the, what's the value in your expression and mm -hmm. like that. Uh, is that like you're doing something under a hood, like parses run by yourself or, cause like, I, I want to know how powerful it is. So I think the question is, um, when I showed right at the start, where I had the, you know, the six times nine equals 42, and then it broke down the values. So you print them out, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, how, how is it doing that and how, how powerful is it? Um, I think I mentioned at the time it's using expression templates to, to decompose it. So what it's actually doing is within the macro, and this is another reason that I need to use a macro to hide this all away, it introduces an, uh, an object uh, called the decomposer, which has an operator on that, which I think is currently, I've been changing it a few times, I think it might be the right, right arrow, right arrow. Um, and that then uh, sort of binds to the left-hand side of the, the expression because it's got a higher precedence than anything up until the logical operator. So it captures that as a value and then captures that in another temporary object which has overloads for all the logical operators, um, which then captures the right-hand side of the, the expression. So most types of expression will bind quite nicely to to those parts and also do uh, uh, single expressions as well, um, unary expressions. Where, where it can break down a bit is if you try to have um, things like you know one plus one equals, actually it does that now, uh, it didn't do before. Uh, there may, may be some limitations around that, but because the, the operator I use to introduce the, the bind is, is very high precedence, um, it pretty much eats the whole of the left-hand side of the expression quite readily. So that means like, uh, so can you include like function call again? Function yeah, oh call? yeah. Oh, yeah you, can, you can do function calls. Uh, you, so you can do most types of um, operation there. Uh, but I'm struggling to think now what does break it. It used to be that you couldn't do the arithmetic stuff on the left hand side, but you can now. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty stable. Well, that shift will break it. Sorry? Shift will break it again. Yes. <laughs> um, although I'm, yeah, yeah, maybe it would actually for that reason. Yeah, don't do that. You can put it in, in brackets, though. Cool. Yeah, to the back. Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, does, uh, and these are really catch questions, as much as catch two questions. Uh, do you support something along the lines of compile fails or compile succeeds as an assertion, or you can put a code snippet in and it attempts to compile or not? Um, so if I got the question right, you want to be able to write a test that tests whether something compiles. Um, not as such. And this is a very interesting area of investigation, and I know some people have been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, I think um, uh, Roland Bock has some very interesting thoughts on this. Um, mostly to do with, uh, can you construct a, some sort of heavily templated type uh, and test whether it would compile or not? I think that's usually what what we're interested in. Um, I think it's come up with, with ways of being able to do that. So it basically reduces it down to some sort of Boolean expression you can test at runtime. Um, but it's not something I've uh, built into catch yet. But that, that is something I'd, I'd like to look at more. And the uh, other question is, uh, do you pro does catch provide um, uh, memory leak detection? So the other question was, does catch provide memory leak detection? And the answer is yes. <coughs> at least on Windows, um, so I put that in. Um, I think somebody was working on a, uh, a Linux version as well. I can't remember offhand whether that's in or not, but it definitely is for Windows. Uh, just, just a basic um, just, uh, Win CRT DB, DBG leak detector. All right, I'm curious, uh, I, since it was someone else perhaps you wouldn't know, but I'm curious how that was implemented because some test frameworks do that using some rather draconian uh, uh, steps and, and to what extent did it sort of interfere with the code? Um, 
to what extent does that interfere with code? I can talk about the Windows one because I know about that implementation. Um, so it's using the, the, the Windows debugger APIs, which just like take a snapshot at the beginning and a snapshot at the end and print out any, any symbols that are linked in the meantime. So the main thing we have to do within catch, and this is why they have that catch session object. In the destructor of that, it's a, because the thing with test frameworks, they all have loads of singletons. Can't get away from them. Um, so it goes through and it cleans up all of the singletons, makes sure any memory they're holding onto is released so that that doesn't interfere with the, uh, the leak results. Um, that's the main thing. There shouldn't really be anything you need to worry about within your own code, unless, of course, you're also using the same APIs. That will probably not play well. But. I'm not. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Uh, do you have uh, report outputs for being consumed by CI systems? So the question is, do I have reporter outputs for different CI systems? Uh, it's a great question because um, uh, there, there should have been a slide on that, or a bit of a demo at least. So Catch has a, a modular reporting system. Uh, the one that I was showing you was the, the default uh, console reporter. There's also an XML reporter, which is Catch's own format. Um, there's a, a JUnit reporter, which should work with most CI systems. The JUnit format itself is not great, which is why I <laughs> did a custom um, catch one. Um, but there's also a, uh, I did a Team City reporter uh, before I joined JetBrains, as it happens. Um, and I think some other people have contributed for other CI systems. Uh, some of those are built in. I can't remember off the top of my head which ones. Probably the TAP reporter, Test Anything Protocol is in there, and I think uh, an auto tool is one as well. Um, or, and you can, you can write your own relatively easily as well if you need to. So yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a <clears throat> recommended approach for, so suppose you have exceptions, you want to check if they, they fire or not. And right. I, it was about a year ago I was working with this. I think I found a workaround, but I'm not sure if that's you know what you have in mind or if you have a special function for dealing with those, those so you want to tests. test whether an exception fired or not yeah um it wouldn't be a great test framework called catch uh, if you couldn't catch exceptions <laughs> uh, so yes uh, there's there's a number of macros assertion uh, macros to do with testing uh, for exceptions uh, okay. um, testing that something doesn't throw an exception testing that something does throw an exception, testing that it throws an exception of a certain type. Um, then there's the, the one that I showed where it will also pass it onto a, a matcher uh, as well, so you can do further testing. Um, and even if you don't write any of those, if you throw an exception that's not caught in your test case, it will catch it outside of there uh, and still report it. And any exception that's thrown, it will put it through a, uh, an exception um, translator, which will effectively re-throw the exception um, and then try to, to match it in a number of catch blocks. So it will catch anything that um, derives from a uh, std exception and call what on it. But if you've got your own exception type, you can write your own um, catcher or tra uh, exception translator for that type as well. Okay. You can then register with that. So it's very rich exception reporting. Okay. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look. As I said, yeah. it was about a year ago. Yeah. But yeah if, it doesn't, if it doesn't answer your question, then let me know. And okay, I'll thanks. Look into it more. Thanks. At the back. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started using Cache. I think we had issues trying to get it to work with recent policy headers. Is that just by the nature of it being paired up header only with the main config defined? Uh, or is there any way to get to that to work? So the question was about using Cache with pre compiled headers, which is tricky because it could be being a single header library with the separate compilation of the main. Um, and that has been tricky. And I know that uh, recently, as in maybe six months ago, I'm thinking, there was some work done to make that easier and certainly possible. Um, I wasn't involved in that work. I just saw it going on. So I can't talk too much of the details. But I know people have been using it. So um, I think there might be a page on the, the documentation about using it with pre-compiled headers now. So I'll take a look at that. And if not, then um, you can reach me. And I'll, I'll look into it more. But you can definitely do it. So. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then 
I think we're, we're done. Thank you very much for coming.